Good morning, everybody. Let's praise our risen Savior together. Good morning, South Church of the Nazarene. Welcome on this Resurrection Sunday. We are so glad that you have decided to join with us this morning online. He is risen. I thought we've been working on this for a long time here. I can't hear you guys. He is risen. He is risen indeed. There you go. Thank you. Well, we're just so excited that you are here with us this morning and uh, we just wanted to communicate with you and connect with you. We understand it's still in this transition time, but we know that God is still in control. And today, as we celebrate his resurrection, I'm excited to be here with you guys this morning. We just have a few things that we want to make sure that you are aware of. Um, we want to tell you that you can still connect with us. There's many different ways. If you go onto our website, uh, you can click on the bulletin. You can pull up the bulletin and see what's going on. You can follow along with Pastor Brad's uh, notes on a sermon. Uh, there's a connect card. We still want you to fill out a connect card. Put it in your comments in there that you're here. What you would like to communicate to us, prayer requests, anything, you can use a connect card for that. Um, also, you can do online giving and uh, make sure that you click on that so you can do that with uh, our website. Also, if you have not uh, downloaded or sent us a text for our Remind app, we would love for you to send that Remind app to us, and it's a great way for us to communicate and still be in contact with us through our uh, texting, which is a great form of communication also. And if you have not, we would love for you to download our uh, South NAS app. If you download that South NAS app, you can do everything that you can do online uh, through our website. You can do it through there, and uh, it's a great, easy way to do that on your uh, phone through Apple or Google Play. We also have something that we were planning on doing on May 16th, and across the nation, they decided to figure out how can we do this uh, World Vision Run. And uh, it's pretty cool stuff here. So what we're going to be doing is uh, the World Vision Run on May 16th is still going to happen, but it's going to be in your own neighborhoods. And uh, we have information on our bulletin that you can go to the website to fill out the information, and we would love for you to do that. This is uh, not just necessarily a run. 
but it is a run or you can walk. Probably what I'm going to be doing is walking, but it's a pretty amazing thing. You can go on there, you can register, you can pay. Once you pay and register, they will send you the bib that uh, goes along with it and the t-shirt for you with the kid that you're uh, helping sponsor with this and, uh, and more information about the race. So we would love for you to do that. Go on to the bulletin, get some information so you can uh, participate in this walk or run. It's a perfect opportunity for us to go out and in our neighborhood and walk. We don't have to have any contact with anybody. Just go and uh, be supportive of that. We're just excited that you're here with us today, and uh, we're excited for what God has in store. We have one more announcement that we're going to share with you this morning, so just enjoy this day that the Lord has made. We wanted to come to you and show to you guys also that even though we've been worshiping online with our church family, we as the youth department also have been worshiping. Every Wednesday night we have been worshiping with Zoom meetings and have had several students come together and uh, been able to do devotions, games, and all that different stuff, which has been pretty amazing. And I come to you here today just to, as a reminder of our few student ministry. This is probably a site where some of you have seen, some of you have never seen, but we're just excited to see that we can't wait to get together with our youth and with our students in our church body, but God is doing some amazing things through that. And uh, this is a great reminder. I would love for you to follow me along in as we walk into our room so we can kind of show you what we do on a normal Wednesday night and uh, just celebrate with us. Here we are at our next step, which is our prayer wall. We use this on Wednesday nights, and if you see here, it says pray big. We really emphasize this with our students to pray big, and especially during this time of uncertainty. Uh, on Wednesday nights when we gather, we pray together. We share requests, and we want to make sure that we're praying for each other as we go through this uncertain times with our students and for our church family. And I would encourage you guys to do the same thing. And as we have been worshiping and meeting on Wednesday nights, like I said earlier, we have been playing some games, which have been so much fun for our youth to get together because a lot of us are just hunkered in our houses and not have things to do. So this morning, I want to bring that here with you guys, this Resurrection Sunday Trivia. So here's the first question, and I want you to really think about this and answer it with your families this morning. So the first question is, according to the Gospel of Matthew, what caused the stone to roll away from the tomb? A, nothing, it silently rolled away. B, a mighty wind blew through. C, a violent earthquake. D, at the sound of trumpets, it rolled away. Answer. Here's the answer to see if you got it right this morning. A violent earthquake. Either you're celebrating or you're just sitting there all boo-hoo that you didn't get it right. So the next question is that we're going to have is this. According to the Gospel of John, who was the first person to enter the tomb to see Jesus was gone? A. Mary Magdalene. B. Simon Peter. C. John. Or D. The Roman soldier. Go ahead and answer to see who can get it right. Let's see the answer. B, Simon Peter. So who got that one right? Do you feel like you're just, boom, you're two for two or you're zero for zero? So the last question that we have this morning is this. According to the Gospel of John, who was the first person to see Jesus after his resurrection? Was it A, Mary Magdalene? B, Simon Peter? C, Mary, the mother of Jesus? Or D, Thomas? Go ahead and answer this morning. Let's see what our answers are. It is A, Mary Magdalene. You see, this is some fun stuff, and we have been doing this on Wednesday nights, and it is so fun to do this with your students, if you have students in youth group, and if not, we would encourage you, if you have any youth that would like to be a part of this, to let me know. You can text me, email me. Anyway, we would love to have them part of this. So please continue to join with us this Resurrection Sunday as we worship our Lord and Savior. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory 
to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three We have an exciting children's lesson from Pastor Gretchen. So kids, gather around and listen up. Hello, South Naz families and kids. Welcome to Power Factory. If you haven't been to our church yet or you haven't walked down to our basement, this is where we have Power Factory with our kids. So come on in and join us for Power Factory this morning. This is where our kids worship on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. And it's a great place that we get to meet together and learn about God and learn different stories. And we want to welcome you here for our kid lesson in Power Factory this morning. 
I'm excited to think about you wearing your Easter outfit this morning and all dressed up ready to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. So today is the day that we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. And resurrection is a big word, meaning Jesus came back to life. Now that is a reason that we want to celebrate. But first we have to go back. Now don't worry, Pastor Brad, I'm not going to go all the way back to creation. But we want to go back and we want to find out what happened to Jesus before this very special day that we celebrate. Now, we're going to travel back, but God, there was a time in the world where God's people, us, were pretty disobedient, doing the things that we wanted to do and going against what God wanted for our lives. Now, God could have gave up on us, but God had a bigger plan, a plan that was going to save us. So he sent himself, himself down to earth to show us the way. Jesus was sent to earth, God's only son, to teach us and lead us in the right direction. Jesus walked on this very earth, performing miracles and teaching us how to follow God. Jesus even found 12 disciples who he called to come and follow him. Jesus traveled all over, spreading the good news and showing love and kindness to all he came in contact with. Word spread of what Jesus was doing and large groups of people would start to follow him, wanting to hear more about what he was doing, hoping that he would heal the people that they knew too. There came a day where Jesus was traveling and his disciples found a colt for him to ride into town. Large crowds of people again began laying down their robes and palm branches, shouting things like, Hosanna, praise God in highest heaven. And we call this Palm Sunday. Now, I forgot to mention, there were some people who didn't like Jesus. They despised him. They disliked him so much that they wanted Jesus dead. Wait, hold on. Jesus, the man who was teaching love and kindness to people and healing people? God's son? That can't be right. But it was. Some didn't believe that he was God's son. Some didn't like what Jesus was doing here on earth. So they thought that the only way to get him to stop would be to trick him and then later kill him. Now, Jesus knew all of this and it wasn't a big surprise to him. It made his heart really, really sad, but he knew that this was all a part of God's plan for why he was here on earth. Jesus prepared to have a last supper with his disciples. Jesus had been telling the disciples that one day he would no longer walk on the earth with them, but the disciples didn't fully understand this. So Jesus broke bread and he told them that this would represent his body being broken. And then he had them drink wine, which would represent his blood that would be spilled. We do this too when we take communion together. Now, none of us were actually there the day that Jesus died on the cross. So we too use these things to help us remember and thank Jesus for what he did for us on the cross. After the Last Supper or the Passover meal, you may hear it said, Jesus went with his disciples to a garden to go and pray. After praying, one of his disciples, his own disciples, came to betray him. His name was Judas. Jesus was arrested and put on trial. Jesus would be asked lots of questions and accused of the wrongs he had done. And this would be his time to stand up for himself and to fight back. But guess what? Jesus didn't defend himself, nor did he fight back. But Jesus didn't need to. He didn't do anything wrong. Some soldiers took Jesus and they made fun of him. They put a purple robe on him and a crown made out of thorns on his head. And they also spit on him. After they had done this, then they made him carry his own heavy cross up to the place that he would die. Jesus was then nailed to a cross, nails going through his hands and his feet. Jesus died on that cross, and it was such a sad day for all those people who had listened to him and had followed him. Jesus took on our sins, all of the sins of each of us, 
so that we could have a relationship with God. His blood was spilled so that we could be washed clean and we could ask him into our hearts and have a relationship with him. But it seemed like there was no hope. He was supposed to save us. He had healed so many people. Couldn't he heal himself? Couldn't he take himself off of that cross? Couldn't he have angels come down and help him? But Jesus was then placed in a tomb that was sealed shut by a large stone. This morning, we're going to go up to the kitchen and we're going to make some empty tomb rolls. And the marshmallow in these empty tomb rolls is going to represent Jesus's body. And we're going to use the dough to cover up Jesus's body, just like he was prepared and ready. His body was prepared and ready to be placed in the tomb. And we're going to seal it. The tomb was sealed shut with a rock, a big stone that was sealed shut, blocking the entrance. No one coming in, no one coming out. Three days would go by, nothing. The tomb would be sealed shut. But three days later, something different happened. An angel came and visited Mary and said, look inside of the tomb. So we're gonna open up our roll. There was nothing inside of the tomb. Just like my marshmallow is gone, Jesus' body was gone from the tomb. The cross is empty. The tomb is empty. My marshmallow is gone inside of the tomb. Just like when Mary went to go see Jesus' body in the tomb. He wasn't there anymore. Jesus has risen and is alive. We can and we should celebrate. I'm going to celebrate by eating my empty tomb roll because Jesus is alive. He's no longer in the tomb anymore. This morning, as we read our scripture, uh, we're going to be reading from Mark chapter 16, 6 through 7, and John 2, 20, 2 through 9. This morning, we're going to start out with Mark, and this is what the scripture says this morning. The angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. John 20, 2 through 9. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stopped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and laying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scripture that Jesus said must rise from the dead.
Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. As we are praising our Heavenly Father on this great Resurrection Sunday, let me remind you of a passage of Scripture that we find in 1 Peter. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who raised Jesus from the dead. Now we live in great expectation. Well, you may have noticed that every week I have a different mug, and this morning my mug says this, Best Day Ever. And the resurrection is truly the best day ever in all of human history. The broken are restored, the failed are forgiven, the lonely are embraced, and as we celebrate 
Easter and all that's connected to the, uh, the resurrection, we are reminded of God's great power in our lives. In fact, Paul the Apostle says this, I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in Him. It is the same power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. And what we know about Jesus sitting at the right hand of God right now is that He is interceding for us. So as we come to our prayer time this morning, we're going to be praying for one another and praying for our community and our city. And we want to remember that Christ Himself is interceding on our behalf. There's several prayer requests I want to remind you about or let you know about. Uh, Joe Clayton has been placed in the hospital. We want to pray for Joe. Uh, Debbie Dorian this past week fell and broke her arm, had to have surgery. Uh, Everything has uh, turned out well, but we want to pray for her healing. Uh, We've been praying for a couple of premature baby twins uh, that uh, are doing very, very well down in Ann Arbor, and we're celebrating that as well. And uh, we want to pray for our teachers, our first responders, our nurses, uh, and, uh, and we found out this last week that one of our friends, uh, a member of our team that went to Honduras, has tested positive for the coronavirus, and so we want to pray for him as well. And, uh, and I just want to invite you this morning to, to pause here on your couch or uh, around the table, wherever you're watching this service this morning. And I want to invite you to to participate in our prayer time. Uh, It is not a chance for you to just watch, but it is actually an opportunity for you to participate. And I certainly want to encourage you to pray for these prayer requests, as well as others that you may know about. And we want to be a part of a congregation that prays for and lifts up one another as we partner with the interceding Christ who is seated at the right hand of the Father today. You are here Moving in our midst I worship you I worship you You are here Working in this place I worship you I worship you You are here Moving in our midst I worship you I worship you You are here Working in this place I worship you I worship you You are Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you.
see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that we are celebrating today. In the midst of the darkness of this coronavirus, the darkness of people whose lives have been lost, uh, the darkness of the economy that is in a, in, a, in a tailspin, Father, we just thank you that the power of the resurrection is available to not only to your church, but to our community. And Father, we just pray that we will experience the power of the resurrection in our lives. Lord, we uh, certainly want to bring these needs before you, the, the needs that we've mentioned. We want to pray for Joe Clayton, Father. I pray that you'll encourage him and touch him, and I know that, that uh, there is a sense of loneliness because he can't connect with people, he can't hear them very well on the phone. All the things that are a part of that, Father, I just pray that you'll encourage and, and strengthen him and be with him and Marguerite today, Father, and I pray that you'll bless them. And we think about others who are uh, in, the, in the nursing home or in hospitals or uh, care centers that aren't able to make outside contact. Father, I pray that you will comfort their spirits today. Father, we pray for Deb as she is recovering from her injury on her, on her elbow, and I pray that you'll bring healing to her body as well. We thank you for the great progress that these premature twins have experienced, and Father, we pray that you'll continue to touch them and their family as, as they are healing and all the things that are part of that. And then, Father, we pray for our nation pray for our president and for the scientists and doctors who are trying to help us find uh, some, some, uh, vi- or some vaccines that will help us and medications that will mitigate the symptoms and all the things that are part of that. Father, we pray for your wisdom and your direction there. We pray for leadership from our president, Father, and that you guide him and, and help him to have a compassionate heart and, uh, and a, wise, uh, a wise mind as he listens to all those who are giving him advice and counsel. Father, we pray for our teachers who are uh, engaging our students online. We pray that you'll give them creativity and understanding and, and help as, as they are seeking to do their very best to help educate our kids. We pray for those who are first responders, those who are on the front lines uh, dealing with um, uh, people who are sick, uh, people who uh, find themselves in some kind of other circumstance where they need a, a, a help. And Father, we just pray that you'll protect our first responders as well as the people they're serving. And uh, Father, we just thank you that we can trust you and that you know more than we can ever even begin to imagine. And Father, I pray for David as he has uh, tested positive for this coronavirus. I pray that you'll encourage him and uh, Linda. And Father, may you bless their lives today and, and may you bring healing to his body. Now, Father, as we, uh, as we listen to all the things that you want to teach us this morning, we've heard from Gretchen, and she has reminded us of the story of, of the resurrection. We've, we uh, will listen, look into your word, and we will hear about Peter and, and how his boldness brought him to a place of being all in. Father, I pray that you'll help us to imagine together 
what it would be like to say, I'm in when it comes to following you. And may the power of the resurrection give us the ability to do that. We thank you for your promise. In the strong, strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, here we are at our time of giving back to Jesus, who has so graciously given to us. We understand it's looking so much differently right now, but uh, we want to just, first of all, say thank you for your generosity. You have responded by giving online with tithes and offerings, and uh, it is a great way for us to continue to give to our Lord and Savior and to our church to help us with uh, our mission that we have. We also want to give you be some update. Because of your generosity, we were able to give $5,000 to the rescue mission here in Lansing to help with everything going on during this crisis in our nation. We want to just say thank you. These tools that we have to give online is a great tool for us. And uh, we want to just ask you to pray diligently for what God has for you and, uh, Lord, as we go from here. Let us pray as we give this morning. Jesus, we thank you so much for this time that we can come together. Lord, I pray that as we give back to you, Lord, that you just continue to bless uh, this church and everything that we can give out of to our community through the generosity of every single giver. We thank you, Jesus, and we just pray that you guide us and direct us in your wonderful name. Amen. I believe in the risen one. I believe I overcome by the power of his love.
Did you know that it took 71 years for flush toilets to be in 50% of American homes? It took 46 years for electricity to be in just 25% of American homes, but it only took 41 years for a landline to be in uh, more than 25% of homes. But now, in today's culture, only 41% even have a landline. 37 years for a car to be a part of American culture in that way, and 25 years for a washing machine. But a personal computer, only 15 years. And the internet, once it hits, seven years. It was in more than 25% of homes. A cell phone was 12 years, but a smartphone only took two. The rate of change is shrinking with each new technology. And they have a word for this. The word for those who are on the front line of adopting things into our culture. They're called the early adopters. Innovators create stuff. Early adopters will stand in line to buy it. Early adopters are the first customers to adopt a new technology. And they have a phrase for them. They're called lighthouse customers because they serve as a beacon of light for the rest of the population to follow, which will take a technology or a product to mainstream. So innovators, they're only 2%, 2.5% of our, uh, of our culture. Early adopters are 13.5%. There's another group called the early majority. They're 34%, and the late majority is the same, 34%. Then they have a, a it's a little bit disparaging phrase for those who kind of are behind. They're called the laggards, and they are the last to adopt something. And then there are what we call the never adopters. They never go into something like that. Well, the question that I was kind of wrestling in my mind is, how do I tell where I fit in this process? Well, let me give you a little bit of a test. Do you have the latest iPhone, the iPhone 11, or a Samsung S20? Then you're probably an early adopter. Do you have a smartphone, but it's several years old? Then you might be a major or an early majority. If you are a late adopter, you probably still have a flip phone, Tom Kiriakou. And if you are a laggard, then you probably still have a, a landline. If you're a never adopter, you probably use the Pony Express or a Telegraph, or you're just too too cheap to replace something that's not broke. Well, the gospel that we have been looking at for the last few weeks has a mix of all of those personalities in, uh, in, the, in the Scripture. John the Baptist and Andrew, the, uh, Peter's brother, were innovators. Behold, uh, uh, John the Baptist says, the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. Or Andrew comes to his brother and says, look what I found. I found the Messiah. Or Andrew was also the one that found the sack lunch that the young boy had at the feeding of the 5,000. Peter, James, and John, they were considered early adopters. They left their nets to follow Jesus. The early majority would be guys like uh, Philip who brought his brother Nathaniel who said, could anything good come from Nazareth? or Mary Magdalene or the, the woman caught in the very act of adultery. The late majority would be people like Thomas or Matthew or Zacchaeus, maybe even Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea who came to get Jesus' body after he was crucified. The laggards would be the folks that adopted at the very end the Roman soldier at the cross when he said, this really was the Son of God or maybe even Pilate, and certainly the Apostle Paul. He had to have a special appointment with Jesus to really embrace the story of Christ. And the never adopters in the Gospel story, well, those are the Pharisees, the religious leaders, those who thought they had it all together. Well, several years ago when I was a youth pastor, I was at a NYC gathering in Washington, D.C., and a guy named Tony Campolo was one of the special speakers. Well, that morning we had breakfast with Tony Campolo, me and, and about a hundred other youth pastors, and we were listening to his, uh, his inspiring words about youth ministry, and, and he said, sometimes youth ministry gets out of balance. We have all these silly games and all these uh, 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 craziness, and uh, we, we miss the invitation to embrace the forgiveness of God and the call to reach others. In fact, he said these words, in America... We spend uh, hours and hours and hundreds of dollars telling the same kids over and over about the love and forgiveness of God, and still 
many of those don't respond. While at the same time in other parts of the world, they are not only eager to hear about the story of God's forgiveness and to respond, but they are ready to go and tell others. And he was kind of scolding us in our, in our uh, ministries and saying, quit messing around and get serious about this. And wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if our kids would respond like that? Well, one brave soul in this breakfast raised his hand. He stood up and he told Campolo, he said, I was one of those kids who heard the gospel message again and again and again. And it was after many times hearing it that I finally responded. And Tony Campolo looked at him straight in the eyes and he said, he didn't say as a late adopter, but he said, you were very expensive. Well, isn't it good to know that we have a very, very generous God? And yes, we certainly want to be people who are telling the story of Christ so that our students and our adults and our children can respond to the gospel of Christ. But uh, we serve a God who is willing to meet us exactly where we are. Well, if we have considered in this uh, um, series of messages over the last few weeks the different responses to this idea of imagine what it would be like to be all in, to say, I am in to what God is doing. We talked about the the fishermen and leaving their nets behind and, and going with Christ. We talked about the good Samaritan who left his credit card at the front desk to take care of all the expenses of the man who was beaten up. We talked about the mountain climbers who were eager to hear the truth of God and climb the hill to to hear and to be in the presence of Christ. We talked about the woman who spent all she had to anoint Jesus. And then we were were reminded of Peter walking on the water and and how he was willing to get out of the boat. And that was an I'm in moment if there ever was one. And then last Sunday, we talked about Judas. Judas who betrayed Christ, who was who said, I'm in, but on the wrong side of, the, of, the, of history. And so today's story is about Peter's response to his denials. We, we know that Peter denied Christ at, the, at the, uh, the gathering around a fire pit. He denied Christ three times, just as P, uh, Jesus said he would do. And uh, Peter claimed he was in. And many times he was all in. He was, he was the guy who would just jump right into the middle of whatever it was, leaving his boats behind, climbing one more mountain with Jesus, walking on the water, or the infamous, I will never deny you, I would die first. So imagine with me what it would be like to have made those kind of claims, to live that kind of bold life that says, I'm following Christ, and then come up short, not once, but often. Well, that doesn't take a lot of imagining for me. In my life, there are times where I've made more bold claims than I've ever fulfilled, and uh, I can understand Peter. I don't have to imagine very hard to understand Peter's life. But uh, if we look at uh, the, the look that, that Jesus gave to Peter when the cock crowed the third time, it says, Jesus turned and looked straight at Peter. Now, I don't know what that look was like. I don't know if it was a a scolding look like our parents are really good at giving to their children. I don't know if it was a stern look like a teacher gave me many, many times when I was in grade school and far beyond that. But um, what we do know is that Peter probably left that scene, and then Peter wasn't at the cross He wasn't among the ladies who went to the tomb early in the morning on Sunday. And uh, it took Jesus' special invitation, as Travis read, go tell the disciples and Peter that you have seen me alive. Go and tell the disciples, including Peter. And then as Travis read, uh, Peter and John began to make their way to the, to the garden, to the tomb where Jesus had been buried. And, and they were running as they, were, uh, as they left the city and they were going out to where this, this uh, burial ground was. And, and uh, Peter and John were running together and, and pretty soon John uh, was moving a little bit further ahead. And, and the Bible tells us that John got to the tomb before Peter did. Now, there's probably some good explanations about that. One of those is that probably John was the youngest of the disciples that were following Jesus. He had young legs, and Peter had old legs, and maybe that was part of it, and he just couldn't keep up with John. But I I began to wonder if Peter, as he was running towards the tomb, 
began to replay some of those things in his mind that happened just in the last few hours. If he remembered saying to that young girl, I don't even know him, and swearing and, and getting upset, no doubt the word had gotten around and Peter was, uh, was, was struggling. He was a no-show at the cross, and, uh, and now he is, he is wrestling. Maybe he's a little bit reluctant. Maybe those words that are in his mind are words like this. I'm a denier. I let Jesus down. I betrayed Christ just as much as Judas did. But for whatever reason, and I don't know why he slowed down, but when he got to the tomb, the Bible is very specifically says, while John was standing inside look, or outside looking, Peter boldly went right through the door. Maybe Peter was an early adopter. He had this early adopting attitude, and that's certainly true about much of his life. And maybe it was that, and, and, and Peter was drawn into, uh, into the tomb, maybe even drawing close to the loving restoration that Jesus was offering to him. Jesus met the disciples several other times after the resurrection. Twice with the disciples, he met with Mary Magdalene, two others on the road to Emmaus, and, and, uh, and then he met the disciples out at the lake. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, Paul writes that Jesus met with more than 500 of his followers before he went back to the Father. What are some of the truths of Jesus' death and his resurrection that we need to embrace from this story today. The first thing is this, that the, the resurrection of Jesus was witnessed and testified about by those who were closest to Christ and also hundreds of others. Many times we forget that part of the story. We don't have a clear uh, gospel uh, presentation of what that is. Paul just references it casually in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But Jesus, when, when he was, res was resurrected, he, it, was, it was witnessed and testified by many, hundreds and even the closest. The second thing we need to know about the death and resurrection of Christ is that his death was for all, once for all. In Romans chapter 6, verse 10, it says this, when he died, when Christ died, he died to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. And in Hebrews chapter 7, it says it like this, verse 26, verse 27, unlike those other high priests, he, Jesus, does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of their people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sins. Listen to me. The penalty of sin was dealt with at the cross when Jesus died. The penalty of sin was dealt with at the cross when Jesus died. So not only did many people see the, death, or the resurrection of Christ, not only did Jesus die for us all, but he offers hope to all of us, to the denier, to the one caught in the act, to the half-hearted follower, to the religious person who don't, doesn't think they even need it. Jesus died for us all. And the story is filled with them. Those early adopters, those, those uh, uh, majority adopters, those, those late adopters, even those laggards. The, 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 the Scripture even tells us about the story of the man who went to the, gar or to the vineyard at the very end of the day and got paid the same. Jesus offers his forgiveness to us all, even to those who don't even think they need it. And isn't that where sometimes we find ourselves? We're folks that get up early on an on a Easter morning, on a Resurrection Sunday, and, and we uh, turn on the television, and we're watching this, this broadcast, and, and we're thinking to ourselves, oh, I've got this kind of figured out. And unfortunately, sometimes we're not that far off from some of the religious leaders that think that their life was what produced their forgiveness when we know that the story of Jesus' death and forgiveness, forgiveness is only offered to us through the cross. The, uh, there's many people who witness Christ's uh, resurrection. The death was once for all, and it was for all to give hope to all of us. And the forgiveness is the beginning, 
not the end. You know, um, we look at Peter's life, and we see Peter uh, boldly leave his fishing boats behind. And then we see Peter trying to tell Jesus what to do. And we see Peter say, I will die for you no matter what. I, I, will go, I, I won't let them do that to you. And then we see Peter say, I don't even know you. And now Peter is standing at the tomb, walked in to see that it was empty. And he's beginning to wonder, what in the world does this mean for me? I don't know what that walk back from the tomb to the place where they were staying was like. I'm sure that John and Peter were trying to figure it out and trying to put together the things that Jesus had said to them because Jesus had boldly told them he was going to die. Jesus had boldly told them that he would be raised again to life. But the tomb was empty. They hadn't seen the Christ yet. Can you imagine what that conversation would have been like as they were walking back? Well, and we know according to Scripture that Mary Magdalene lingered behind and that she actually got to meet Jesus and see Jesus and talk to Him. But what we do know about Peter is that this changed his life forever. The power of the resurrection gave Peter the power to live according to his bold claims. The power of the resurrection gave Peter the ability to do what God had called him to do. And in John chapter 21, we read about Peter this time not walking on the water, but when they were out fishing and Jesus was on the shore, Peter dives into the water and swims all the way to the shore. He doesn't have to walk on water to show off or to, to experience God's power. He wants to do whatever it takes to get into the presence of Christ, and he does in John 21. In Acts chapter 1, we read about Peter stepping up to lead, and he says, you know, we need to replace Judas, and we need to get this, this, uh, this movement going forward. In Acts chapter 2, Peter is filled with the Spirit. He preaches to the same crowd that cried, crucify him, and th this time instead of crying out, crucify him, they respond to his mercy and forgiveness. And 3,000 people come to a, 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 a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. In chapter 3, the book of Acts, Peter tells the cripple, I don't have money, but what I have I'll give to you. And he heals him. And in Acts chapter 4, Peter says, I'm in with these words. He's being questioned by the religious leaders. They're saying, hey, quit talking about Jesus. We don't want you to do that. If you keep doing that, we're going to have to put you in prison. But we don't want to keep you in prison because the people out there, they're upset that we have you in, in, in here and we want to let you go. But this is what he says to them. Don't, uh, this is what they say to him. Don't talk about Jesus. You can leave. We're going to let you go. But don't talk about Jesus. And Peter's response is this. Do you think that God wants us to obey you rather than him. And then it says they went out from that place and preached the word in boldness. So we get to that place in every message that I preach. We get to that place where we ask this question, so what? What does that mean for me? How does that apply to my life? And let me just ask you a few questions to help you explore that. Have you ever embraced or adopted the story of Jesus' death, life, death, and resurrection, and all that it offers to you? Or are you a wait-and-see kind of person? I don't need it just yet. I don't want to change my life completely to follow Christ. I, I, I want to experience Christ, but I don't, want to, I don't want to have my whole world turned upside down. In John chapter 14, Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going to go to heaven, and I want to invite you to come with me. And you know the way, and so uh, where I will be, there you will be with me also. And Thomas, the one who later doubts that Jesus had actually resurrected, uh, Thomas says, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. We don't know the way. And Jesus says to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The death of Christ on the cross brings us the opportunity to have our, our sin not only forgiven and paid for, but it gives us the opportunity to experience the mercy and grace and love of Christ. And the resurrection gives us the power to live according to God's calls in our life. 
If you've been waiting, if you've been a, a late adopter, then know this, today is the day. It's the best day ever. Today is the day. It's a day that if for the very first time you have heard the story of God's forgiveness, that you can have a heart that is clean and you can be in right relationship with God. And because of that, you can be in heaven forever and forever. Then today is the best day ever. You can respond to God's forgiveness. The Bible says if we will confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Today is the day of salvation. Maybe you've received God's God's forgiveness in the past, and, and you're kind of standing on the edge, just watching from the side. Today is the day to say, I'm in. Imagine what it would be like if your life was completely and totally under the control and the authority of Christ. We would have not only the very best things that God intended for us to have from the beginning, but we would experience his mercy and grace personally and have the power to go out into this world and live the way he's called us to live. Would you be willing to say, I'm in? In just a moment, we're going to pray a prayer as we finish today, and, and uh, we want to invite you to step into his love to step into his mercy, which is when uh, he withholds the punishment that we genuinely deserve. We invite you to step into his grace when he gives us what we could never, ever earn on our own. And we invite you to, uh, to experience his forgiveness. So I'm going to pray a prayer today. And maybe there in the, in the living room where you're watching this or in the kitchen or wherever it is that you're watching this program today, maybe you want to just bow your head and pray a prayer with me to experience the very promise of God that today can be the very best day ever. Bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Our gracious Father, we thank you that from the beginning of time, when, when Adam chose to go his own way, you made a plan for us to be right with you. And Jesus brought that plan to earth. He lived. He died. He was resurrected so that we could experience all that you have for us. Father, I ask you to apportion to me the forgiveness that Christ paid for on the cross. Would you help me to receive that forgiveness? Father, I pray that you will give me that clean heart and give me the power to live a life that's under your direction. Lord, I, I want to I wanna live a life that says I'm in. I'm in on your forgiveness. I'm in on your promise. I'm in on your power. And I'm in on the, the hope that, that heaven will be my home. I want to say I'm in. And I choose that today. In Jesus' strong name, amen. Well, uh, I'm glad you were able to watch this show on uh, the service on uh, uh, the webcast today. And I would much rather be with you in person. I'd love to, to hear your story and what God is doing in your life. And so this is what I'm going to ask you to do. Maybe you filled out a Connect card at the beginning of the service, and that's great, and I appreciate that. That is the only way that we can connect with you during these times, and there's many of you that have been watching that I have not met yet, and I'm looking forward to the day when we can gather back together and meet together today, or back together here in this place. But uh, maybe today you asked Christ to forgive your sins. Maybe you said to Christ, I'm in I want to experience what you have for me. Well, if that's you, I want to invite you to fill out that Connect card. There's instructions on the screen. It will show you how to do that and, and get you connected. If you'll just let me know, today I prayed to be all in, or today I asked for God's forgiveness, or whatever note that maybe that you want to write to me, I, I want to, to be able to pray with you and to pray for you. And uh, again, I look forward to the day that we can meet together again but I know this, by writing that down, we are putting a stake in the ground that said on Easter morning, 2020, when the world was as dark as it's ever been, I stepped into the light. I hope that you did that today, and I want to invite you to, to let me know about that because we want to pray for you. Well, thanks for being together with us this morning. We're going to sing some more. I'll come and do a benediction in just a moment. 
Let's pray together as we close. Father, we thank You for Your promise in Scripture that You want to work Your mighty power in us. The resurrection power You long to work in us. We reach out to receive that. Work in us and through us to accomplish more than we could ever ask or even begin to imagine. Not because You push us around, but because You work within us by Your Spirit shaping us into the people you long for us to be. We pray that you will help this Resurrection Sunday to be, be the beginning of a new adventure with you. In Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen.